Welcome to Love and Responsibility LA. Um, if it is your first time with us, our mission here is to form hearts and minds to love authentically through the teachings inspired by John Paul II. We began the summer of 2020 with the support of our beloved Bishop David in the San Gabriel region in Los Angeles. We ask for his intercession today as we have this talk. So without further ado, I want to welcome our speaker, Dr. Bob Schutz. He's actually the author of Be Healed, which is awesome because we've been having our weekly study groups with Be Healed. He's also the founder of the JP2 Healing Center in Florida, and he's just a good father and a pioneer for healing, and we're so thankful to have him. Hi, Dr. Bob. How are you? Hey, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we want to start, um, of course, we start everything with a prayer. So if you're okay with that, if I can start with a prayer, Dr. Bob. All right. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for um, bringing us all together to hear your message and your truth. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be about Dr. Bob. Um, the Holy Spirit would be about everything that he says. And I pray that you would just open our hearts and minds to hear the message and to really learn, Lord, um, about the teachings of John Paul II. So thank you, Lord, for all you've done in your faithfulness. And we just pray you continue um, to let this ministry flourish for you. In your holy name, Jesus. Amen. All right. It's all yours, Dr. Bob. Thank you, Jen. Yes. First of all, I just want to say uh, many of you are in that Los Angeles area and um, Bishop David O'Connell, I'm sure was very dear to you. I know for Jen. Uh, hi, everybody. How are you? Uh, I know Jen was uh, sharing with me just some of the impact and that impact was for us as well, all over the church. Uh, I only had an opportunity to talk with Bishop David once and uh, just had a great admiration for him as a person and um, just as a, as a leader in the church. And we had talked about him being a part of our healing uh, conferences, healing retreats, and uh, just never got there. But I can only imagine for those of you who knew, knew him very well, like I know Jen worked with him very closely, for those of you who had a close relationship, uh, I heard, in, you know, we're talking about masculinity and femininity and healing that. I heard of the depth of the depth of his uh, fatherhood, and that fatherhood is really a picture of what full masculinity is. And I know also that many of you have experienced uh, Jen's motherhood, the motherhood of some of the religious sisters around, others in the community. And as, as we think about that, as we think about the difference of what we've experienced from fathers and from mothers, uh, and some of us not having the opportunity to have good mothers and good fathers around. But if we have had good fathering and good mothering, we know, we know experientially the qualitative difference there. It's... Uh, there's something about fathering that is so different than mothering. And in that, the, the, the critical thing is the masculinity and femininity. It's, it's that uh, expression of feminine love and the expression of masculine love. And those are really two different things. So before I get into the talk, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the loss, the loss of fatherhood. I mean, John Paul II said this is the key to understanding all reality is the attempt of the enemy to abolish fatherhood. And we can look at something that happened with Bishop David as a picture of that, as a picture of this really loving father, this, this uh, father who gave his heart, who gave Jesus his heart to all of you. And in his fatherhood, uh, there's, a, there's an emanation of the father expressing his heart. And the enemy comes and tries to abolish that. He, he comes to try to interrupt that, to take that away. 
And in whatever way we've experienced that, uh, whether we've experienced it personally in our families or we've experienced it uh, in the church with the loss of, you know, say, uh, Bishop O'Connell, there, there's a there's a loss of of uh, communion with God. You know, God's still present, but in an experiential way, we we lose a sense, we lose an experiential sense of His presence, and. You know, the same thing's true when we lose uh, women in our life that are close to us. I, I lost my wife uh, two weeks after my father died, so two weeks apart. And I got to feel how qualitatively different those experiences were. You know, the difference, the, the loss of my my dad and then the loss of my wife. And then watching my children and grandchildren go through also the loss of their mother and grandmother. And uh, they're both deep losses. But as we're talking about this in terms of masculinity and femininity, there, there's really a different quality to the losses. There's a different experience to being a, a husband losing a wife versus being a daughter or a son losing a mother or a grandchild losing a grandmother. And so also, you know, for all of you in the community with with Bishop David, you know, I believe that all of you are in some ways not only shocked by the suddenness of it, but grieving his fatherhood, grieving his brotherhood. And I believe you experience it differently as men and women. I, I think everybody experiences the loss, but we experience it differently. And I think the the, the difference is also with the, le the level and depth of relationship. So whatever... You know, the closer the relationship, the more the, the the shock, the more the trauma, but also the more the grief. And that's also true in our families. The, the, the closer, the more intimate the relationship, the more devastating the trauma is. And so as we're going to talk about healing today, a good part of healing is being willing to grieve, to be able to grieve our losses. And it takes good mothers and good fathers, good brothers and good sisters to help us in our grief. Because we can't grieve in isolation. It's really difficult to grieve in isolation. The, the, the grieving requires the presence of those who love us. And I don't know if you can think back in your life of times when you've gone through grief and experienced what it's like to have a woman comforts you in that grief and what it's like to have a man comfort you in your grief. And how would you express that? How would you, you know, if you just think about that for yourself, if you were to experience loss and grief, whether it's a, a small kind of loss or a big kind of loss, like a, like a disappointment, that's one kind of loss, or a really close relationship, relationship with a friend or a relationship with uh, a parent. And how might men comfort in that loss? And how, how do women comfort in that loss? And, and what's it like when you lose a woman that you're close to in your life? And what's it like when you lose a man that you're close to in your life? And I, I'm saying all this because as you're studying love and responsibility and studying the difference between male and female, that sometimes this is really hard to describe the, the differences in, in objective ways, but I think all of us know the subjective experience. I'll just share out of my own life. Growing up with my family, I had both a mom and a dad in home. I had grandparents around. And you know, if you've been reading Be Healed, those of you who've been reading Be Healed, you know that my dad left when I was 13. And my mom did a great job of keeping the family together, of, of loving us. But she couldn't be my dad. No matter what she did and how much she tried to function in that place, you know, particularly as a teenage boy, there was something that only my dad could give me. And so... I longed for that in my heart until I saw him again a couple years later. 
If you grew up with only one parent, or maybe some of you grew up with two mothers uh, or two fathers, it's it's a very different qualitative experience. And, you know, depending on how the quality of love of a mother, the quality of love of a father, there's also a real difference there. Uh, and that also is something we need to be grieving. That is, let's say you had two parents in your home, but one or both of them were really distant. You didn't experience what you needed from a father. You didn't experience what you needed from a mother if, if there's distance there or if there was a lack of trust there or if there was a brokenness in the relationship. And so while we have permission to grieve a loss like Bishop David's tragic death, we also need to have permission to grieve all those losses in our life. It, it took me 20 years before I could grieve my father leaving when I was 13. It took me till I was in my late 20s, almost early 30s, before I had the ability to grieve that loss. And it was only because other things were going on in my life that were bringing up that pain. And it was the therapist that I sat with and the therapist asking me to tell my story and I had no emotion to it. I had no emotion to my own experience. And it was only as the therapist was asking me questions and this again was a female therapist. I think it was really critical that it was a compassionate heart of a woman asking those questions because when she was asking, she began to cry as I was telling my story. And her tears helped me thaw those areas of my heart that had gotten frozen, that had gotten hardened from the pain. At the same time, I had coaches in my life, other men in my life that were really important at that time that I could share with. And those experiences of being able to relate to women and being able to relate to men, each were important in the healing process. And so as we're talking about healing, I'm going to talk about how, what we, where we need healing and, and the kind of uh, ways that which we heal. But I also want to talk about the ways in which we normally grow into wholeness in a healthy situation. Like, what is God's intention for our wholeness? And I want to start with the idea of what you've been learning in love and responsibility. I, I also have a great love for John Paul II, and uh, that's why we're the John Paul II Healing Center. Uh, is He's become a real major influence in my life and all of our lives. Um, but as he talks about masculinity and femininity and starting in love and responsibility and then in the theology of the body and throughout his teaching, he, he starts at the beginning. He starts with Adam and Eve. And one of the things that's not often discussed uh, in the theology of the body, and I don't think he mentions it in love and responsibility, is the Hebrew word for male and the Hebrew word for female. Uh, I know you can't answer me on, on the screen right now, but does anybody know what the Hebrew word for male is? You can just raise your hand if you, if you know what that word is. Or the Hebrew word for female. Uh, it's right in the creation story. And it really, when I began to study this and, and began to do some research, it really opened up an understanding of what God intended for us as male and female. And I think it's what our culture really needs as a fundamental understanding. So the word for male in the Hebrew is a word, zakar, Z-A-K-A-R. Very strange word. And if you were to look it up on the internet, be careful because there's some strange images that come. You know, uh, I've had people look it up. I haven't looked up in, in that particular way. But it's an image of men's penises 
that come up on the internet when you put that word in there. But there's something else that comes up on that, which is, I think, really important in the connection. And it's the definition of zakar, which is to remember. I know that sounds strange. What does to remember have to do with a male, particularly when we make jokes about men forgetting anniversaries and other stuff like that? You know, what what is to remember have to do with being what God intended to be a male? Well, if you trace it all the way through the scriptures, that word to remember is the word for covenant. When Jesus made the new covenant, he became the fulfillment, the fullness of what God intended for masculinity, to live faithfully in a covenant. Because if you think about it, a woman's relationship with her child is natural. A woman carries the child in her womb. Unless she's adopted the child, you know, the natural way for children to come into this world is in the womb of a woman who then nurtures, who then breastfeeds. And so the bond, as John Paul II says, the bond between mother and child is, is natural and instinctive and, and uh, connected, a deep sense of communion. But the man's connection is from the outside. He doesn't have that same connection to a child. He had the connection to the woman who bore that child. So from the very beginning, what did God plan? God planned that the man would be in part of a covenant, the same kind of covenant that God had with us as human beings. God intended that to be imaged by the man with the woman and the children so that children could grow up in the security of male and female love. So then we begin to see all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament the understanding of what it means to be a male made in the image of God. It means to be someone who has the kind of faithful love, the kind of has said love that God has, the faithful kindness and tenderness to keep a covenant, to continue to be present and to forgive and to be, be loving in that way. And when Joseph came, and he was with Mary, he became that faithful man and gave ex Jesus the example of what it means to be faithful. So why in the Old Testament was it the male's sexual member that was circumcised? Because that's the place that God was calling him to remember. Remember what I've called you to be. I've called you to not just to generate but to care for the generations, to be faithful in your love so that the, the, the vulnerable love of mother and child can be augmented and supported by the love of a husband and a father. And what's the word for female? Anybody know that in Hebrew? It's a, it's a strange word. It doesn't even have any vowels. It's, it's negaba. It's N-Q-B-H with some apostrophes in it. And the word literally means to be open. And you think about the feminine body, and the feminine body is open to receive the gift of life. She receives the seed of life, and she then nurtures that seed of life in the womb and then with her breasts, and with her body, and with her love. And what does that mean to be open? It means to be receptive. The heart of a woman, just like her body, is created to be receptive, to nurture, to care for, to receive, to love. And you see that complementarity that's there between male and female, and how every child, if they're to grow up in wholeness, needs the integration of both of those. So many of us have not experienced that in fullness. Some of us have, haven't experienced that in the way that we've needed to. And before anything else happens to us in our sexuality, any of our own choices or anything that happens around us, 
that's really the first and foundational level of healing that we all need. We need healing from the ways in which we haven't been loved well by a mother and father together, and that they haven't loved each other well. Because every child's heart, male and female, is wounded to the extent that mother and father haven't loved each other well. Every child has that as a, as a fundamental desire of their longing in their nature to experience love from two parents who love each other. That's why the church's teaching about sexuality is so important, because everything that separates from that, you know, children are born without the covenant of marriage, children are born from a test tube, uh, injection from, you know, a sperm donor, all of those negate what God has designed and created for that, that kind of intimacy. And so if we think about this in terms of development, every one of us, and I just want you to think about your own history here, every one of us needs to feel a secure attachment with mother and father. That's where trust is developed. That's where our sexuality is formed from the earliest ages. You know, our sexuality doesn't just blossom in our teenage years. Our sexuality begins with those first fundamental attachments with mother and father. And when we're securely attached to both mother and father, we naturally identify with our same sex parent. We naturally want to be like both parents, but we want to identify if we're a man with our father or if you're a woman with your mother. It's a natural progression. But if there's a broken relationship there with your same-sex parent, that becomes part of what happens with gender confusion, gender, gender dysphoria, same-sex attraction. It all starts there in those early years when those, when those secure attachments and identification doesn't happen. When a child's secure in that way with both mother and father, they're much likely, less likely to be sexually abused they're much less likely to be sexually promiscu promiscuous in the teenage years. They're much less likely to engage in pornography, masturbation uh, in the teenage and, and adult years. That's how fundamental that, that bond of love is. But when a child doesn't receive that in the family and they don't identify and they go into the next stage of development, which is being around peer groups and getting their affirmation of their identity around peer group, there's a sense of not belonging and a not measuring up. And that's where a lot of the teasing and a lot of the ridicule can take place in a child's life. You know, our culture can be around so many different ways. It could be around our bodies. It could be around our, our lack of confidence. It could be in so many different ways. But it's in all those ways that we need healing. And most of what we see manifested later on in life has those root areas that are, that are fundamentally needed and not, not received in the way that they were. And it just opens it up uh, to problems afterwards. I could say when, after my dad left and there was a lack of protection and there was a lack of that, each of my brothers and sisters, including myself, engaged in one way or another in sexual sin. And there was also other things that happened to each of us, attempted sexual abuse and other things. That's how important that protective love of a mother and father is for a child, even all the way through teenage years. And, you know, so much of what we see in our culture and what our culture is trying to address really go back to these deep root issues these deep attachments and identification and belonging. And from there, we naturally develop in our sexual identity and sexual confidence. So let me tell two quick stories just to illustrate this so you get, a, get an opportunity to see it. And I know many of you are going through Be Healed right now and you're not to the end of it, but this is uh, coming up pretty quickly uh, in the chapters to come. Uh, 
Well, I guess maybe you've already been through chapter six, some of you. And so it, John's story, this is John's story. And I don't finish John's story till the end of the book, but John was a young man who was a leader in a Catholic ministry, really good man, but he had overcome uh, drug addiction uh, through 12-step work, but he was really having a difficult time overcoming his sexual addiction, which was primarily related to pornography, fantasy, and masturbation, although he also had struggled earlier with promiscuous relationships. At this point, he wasn't in those relationships, but he was still really wrestling with uh, his sexual compulsion. And he was going to spiritual direction. He was going to confession regularly. He was uh, practicing the principles of 12 steps, and he just couldn't get free. It was just so deeply rooted in his life. And he was beginning to despair. And his pastor sent him uh, to me for, for therapy, but also for prayer. And as I heard his sharing about how he was struggling, he was really doing everything that I would have recommended somebody to do. I, it was like I was dumbfounded of why he wasn't having more freedom, because he was doing all the things that we would generally recommend. He was having... Uh, you know, computer software to, to monitor his pornography use. He was doing, he had gotten rid of his computer and now he was acting out in the library at, at school when he would go to study. Um, so after the first couple of times, I just said, you know, John, that's not his real name, but John, I really don't know what else to say. Only thing I know how to do is pray now. And so if you're willing to do this, both of us go fast and pray for the next couple of weeks until we meet again. And after, when you come back, we'll see what we both hear, because this is beyond my clinical expertise, and this is beyond you. You've been trying and every, everything that hasn't been helping. So when we came back, we came back with the same answer, which was a real confirmation for both of us that God had spoken to us. We received it from different ways. I remembered somebody I'd worked with in the past and their path to freedom. He had read it in a book. But in both cases, we heard that we needed to walk into his fantasy life. And nobody wants to walk into anybody else's fantasy life. I mean, that's just really an invasion of privacy and it's a very shameful thing. And so both of us were really reluctant and I was also reluctant that he might get aroused if we walked into his fantasy life. And I, I didn't want to be aroused by his fantasy. You know, there's just a lot in both of us that says this isn't a good idea, but we were convinced this was the Holy Spirit. And so we went and uh, began to explore. And, and again, I don't want to be uh, graphic here. I just want to say enough so that you understand. In his fantasy life, life, there was a place where he would get aroused when he would think about and, and visualize a woman's breasts. And as he began to share that, I just had a sense that we needed to stop and pray at this moment. And so we did. We stopped and prayed. And my prayer was very simple. And it's, if you're reading Be Healed, it's similar to what I talk about there. And I just said, Holy Spirit, would you please bring us to the roots of this fantasy, where this is rooted, where the wounds are underlying this fantasy? Immediately, he didn't tell me at the time because he just started crying really intensely. But immediately he was brought back to being a baby, watching his mother breastfeed his sister. And it took him quite a while to share with me. And I'm just imagining uh, he must have been sexually abused or there must have been something that happened here. And when he finally told me, I just didn't know. It, it just seemed so innocent. I didn't know how to take it. And he, and he said, uh, I'm about two years old. I'm about two and a half years old in this image that Jesus is showing me. And my mother is breastfeeding my sister. And I am just hating my sister and hating my mother and I'm feeling so much pain 
And again, I'm just baffled. I don't understand why this is happening. And he says, but then Jesus enters in because we prayed for Jesus to come into the place of his trauma. He said, Jesus is coming and Jesus picking me up and he's bringing me to Mary, his mother, and Mary is nursing me. And I could see in his countenance as we went from the memory to the healing of that memory, he went from just sobbing, deep grief to joy, just this incredible joy and peace. I could tell a healing had taken place, but I still didn't understand it. And so I said, after the end of that meeting, I said, let's go a month and see how you're doing. He had never been able to go more than three weeks without acting out a sexual compulsion. He went a month, he came back and he said, I don't have any temptations. I just feel free. Something happened. So I said, let's go two months. We went two months and he says, I don't have any temptations. I just really feel free. And I'm still not understanding it, but I'm really, we're both praising and thanking God for the healing that took place. Well, six months later, he was still free and he had to move away. So when I was getting ready to write Be Healed, I wanted to share his story in the book, but I didn't know how to get in touch with him. I, he, nobody that I knew knew where he was. And this is 10 years later. And 10 years later, he calls me out of the blue. And he says, I want to tell you what happened after I left. And I said, I can't believe you just called because I've been praying to get in touch with you. And I wanted to share your story uh, in the book that I'm writing. And he then told me, and my heart fell when he told me, he said, I was free for about five years. And then I fell back into it. And I was just, just really crushed for him. But he says, but wait, it gets better. He says, after really struggling terribly, he says, I found other people to pray with me like you prayed with me. And he said, what happened is we went back to the memory that I wasn't willing to face that day in your office. He says, I, I kind of knew it was there, but it was too painful to go to. And he said, it was six months earlier, before my sister was born, my mother was nursing me and she had to wean me instantly because her mother was dying in another country. So she left for six months, no, for six weeks. And I was, I was just uh, dramatically weaned. And so I stayed with my dad for those six weeks while my mother was gone. When she came back, I had completely shut my heart off because of the pain. I didn't want anything to do with her. And so that memory that I had of my mother nursing my sister was my envy towards my sister, my anger towards my mother, and my heart being shut off. And it was the first time that I felt the pain of that, but I wasn't ready to go to the pain of the abandonment that I felt. Now, did the mother do anything wrong? No. May not have been the, the wisest thing, but she was doing what she needed to do to be with her mother. Did John do anything wrong? No, he was just a little boy. But the pain was so great and he closed his heart off so much that it, that it became the root of these sins of envy and anger and then lust. And that influenced all of his relationships from that point forward. Again, I, I want to emphasize how important those early attachments are and the early identifications are because they continue to play out in our life. You know, sexual intimacy is, can be an intense form of connection, but can also be a means of, of false connection and fantasy about false connection that doesn't really provide what's necessary there. So that's one story. And I just want to illustrate that, that the connection between sexual compulsion and deep emotional, psychological, psychosexual wounds. Another example, and I'm going to be quicker here so that we have time for questions, um, is a woman who came in who uh, shared that she was a lesbian. And when I began to explore her history, and, and she was, you could tell she was kind of tough, 
uh, and and kind of had a there were you know when you talk about women being open receptive there was a place that was closed and really protective just like there was in John but there was you know for her heart she'd kind of become more masculine in her demeanor and her attitude and when I heard her story I understood she had been sexually abused as a as a young girl by her dad and so she developed this hatred for her dad and a hatred for her sexuality she blamed her feminine body and her feeling pleasure in her body when she was abused with the pain she felt them both at the same time it created a lot of confusion in her and she made this vow that i'm not going to i'm not going to be vulnerable to a man again i'm never going to open myself to a man again and so in her teenage years as she was searching for for love and affection and comfort and her sexuality was developing it was much easier for her to look at a vulnerable woman and and try to take care of that vulnerable woman which led into this homosexual lifestyle than it was for her to open and trust herself to a man again what we look at on the outside is choices that were made in the teenage years that carried on into adulthood but underneath all that was this deep trauma and wounding in her sexuality from the very person who was supposed to protect her and bless her and help her to be safe in her sexuality without her now feeling safe she she felt safe with women but not with men it influenced her relationship with men from that point forward now with lesbian relationships or any kind of same sex attraction there are lots of different variations okay there's lots of different kinds of wounding that take place in those situations just like there are with sexual compulsions i don't want to paint a picture that it's if there's a, a same sex attraction it always goes back to this or if there's a, a sexual compulsion it always goes back to this we need to discover in each person's individual life where those traumas and broken attachments are and the places where it's not safe uh but in my experience there are always places where our sexuality has been formed in those early attachments and those early relationships where we feel either safe or not safe and the decisions we make to respond to that so i think at that we can go through a lot more i talk a lot more in about this and my book be restored um but jen i'm going to turn it back to you for question and answer and uh and then we can see where it goes i think we can get more specific to the things that are on people's hearts right all right thanks bob that was wonderful a lot of those stories are so helpful um so we have a lot of different questions from online so again if you're online just put your question in the Q&A. If you're on live, Ray will hand you guys the QR code. You can put your questions there. So the first question, Bob, is there's a lot about healing actually um of resentment, but here's the first one. How do I continue to heal my perspective about men? I have had a really bad experience of feeling used by men who only care about lust or sex, and it seems like those types of men are prevalent in the male population. So how does she heal that? Yeah. It, this is going to be inadequate, but I'll give you some key points here. Uh the first of all is recognizing what you are doing that there's a lot of resentment there and there's a lack of trust there's a, there's a place where your heart is closed from the ways of being violated and you've made judgments and there's unforgiveness but there's also underneath all that broken attachment broken trust feeling used and and feeling uh, violated in that so the healing has to take place at all those levels first of all to just name the judgments often times when we're hurt by specific men we begin to see all men in that category okay and and what happens is jesus is a man jesus wouldn't violate you there are other men like bishop david around like good men around that aren't going to treat you that way and so to be able to distinguish between men violating you 
and men in general is really an important beginning because you, when you cut yourself off from men because you've been violated, you cut yourself off from what you need in your sexuality from men. And again, I don't know how far back that goes, but it sounds like there's a good history there. The second is there needs to be uh, deep forgiveness, which is, again, in Be Restored, I, I have a whole process for doing this, which is really taking into account how you've been violated and feeling the anger, feeling the hurt, uh, recognizing what's been wrong, naming it without falling into judgment, just naming that and then walking through the process of forgiveness for those specific people. Uh, also probably breaking soul ties with those people where you felt violated, which is those unhealthy attachments that were there. But then as we are talking about in the beginning, there's real grief there in your heart because your little girl heart longed for chaste, secure, faithful, protective love, not only from the adults, your parents, but also from the men that you were attracted to, the men that you allowed yourself to be close to. And, and there's real hurt, there's real grief, there's loss, and there's loss of attachment, there's loss of fulfillment, there's loss of comfort, there's loss of protection. And so naming those losses and grieving them is what allows your heart to begin to open up. And you can only do that in safety. You can't do that when you're threatened. And so probably for you, it'd be with a woman to start with. But at some point, it's going to need to be with a man where you begin to risk trusting that a man can be caring and, and, and faithful to God in the way that he relates to you and see your dignity and treat you in that way. So that's, that's a beginning. It's not enough, but that's a beginning. Yeah, I think that will definitely help her for sure. Because when you cut off part of your heart, it's like cutting it off completely. You know, it's cutting love off. Yep. Um, someone else had a question, Bob. Um, is forgiveness essential for healing? Yes. Uh, it's, forgive it's, it's essential for several reasons. Catechism talks about, uh, this is under the section where it talks about uh Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catechism says, we cannot receive God's mercy and healing if our hearts are hardened by unforgiveness. And so only as we walk through the process of forgiveness do our hearts open to be able to receive the love that we long for first from God and then from other people. Yeah. It's God forgives face. us. God yeah. forgives us. We can't receive it. It's a block. It's a barrier. Yeah. Do you remember that quote Pope Francis said, when your hearts are hardened, um, those stones fall in your hands? <laughs> yeah. I thought that was pretty powerful. Yeah. That is um, pretty, we become Pharisees yeah. who want to throw stones. Right. Um, what are some of the core differences of masculinity and femininity? Yeah. The starting with that definition of man is Zakar and woman is uh, Negaba, I think there's fundamental difference having to do with what the purpose of our sexuality is, which is in procreation and in nurturing the life that we generate. Uh, and so, you know, men's different, men's brains and women's brains are different. Uh, Men's bodies, women's bodies are different. Men's hormones, women's hormones are different. And so those all have an influence on our psychology. Mm. And they also have an influence on our spirituality. We approach God differently. You know, it's, it's a lot easier for a woman to relate to the bridal image with God than it is, you know, the bride and the bridegroom than it is for a man. It's, it's, it gets confusing, even though we're all the bride of Christ. A woman naturally experiences Jesus in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, a man, if, if she hadn't been wounded, a man doesn't naturally. So the father-son relationship in relation to Jesus is much more natural, or brother with Jesus is much more natural relationship. So it influences our relationship with God and with other people. Um, I would say some of the, you know, both men and women are tender, but the tenderness of women is different than the tenderness of men. Mm. Men and women are strong, but the strength in men is different than the strength in women. Uh, 
both men and women are compassionate, but the eminence of a woman's heart is different than a man's heart. You know, so there's a lot of differences that are physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological get, get played out in our relationships. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one small example. When my children were born, um, I remember my wife holding our, my first daughter, Carrie, and uh, mm -hmm. counting her fingers and toes and just noticing her breasts. And I'm thinking about how am I going to pay for her college and how I'm going to pay for uh, her wedding <laughs> on the day that she's born. <laughs> uh, and I think there's something really natural in that. Uh, like a, a man looks at the big picture responsibility and a woman looks at the intimate personal responsibility, even though I soon counted toes and held her and everything else. But I just think there's a natural difference in the way that we're wired that plays itself out in the way that we love each other and you know, the way that we love children. Hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's the hard part, respecting the difference in the other, right? That they're going to see it the way you see it. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so it says, thank you for sharing your wisdom, Dr. Schutz. Do you have any advice or tips on how to approach or heal a relationship where the partners are both hurt by sexual past of one of them? The one partner experiences shame, fear, feelings of not being worthy of the other. The other partner feels hurt and the infidelity wounds to a certain extent, even though it happened in the past? Yes. Uh, great question. And I've run into that many times. Uh, first of all, to validate the wisdom of the question, because it's those two things are both really important, uh, both sides. Uh, I would say you probably, in the beginning, need somebody else to help you each in the healing of those deeper hurts before you can help heal each other. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's so reactive with each other, uh, just in the way that you described. And so what does that look like for the person who uh, feels betrayed? First of all, is to validate that even if it happened before you were together, it was a betrayal. Wow. It, it is an infidelity, right? Mm -hmm. Because that sexuality was reserved was was intended to be reserved for a marriage relationship right right and if you were thinking about being with this person in a marriage relationship it was an infidelity and it may be both people had infidelity uh, or only one but it is real betrayal it's real trauma it's real hurt mm -hmm. and it needs to be acknowledged it needs to be uh repented of in that way. Uh, and there needs to be a healing process that goes on in that place of hurt. And again, grieving, forgiving, um, naming the pain, experiencing the anger, all of those things. On the person who's the one who has had a sexual past, again, as rightly described, there's, there's shame, there's inadequacy, there's uh, you know, a, a sense of being dirty or, or, or unworthy, unworthy, being unfaithful. And both people need mercy. Uh, and and when, a, when the person who's been hurt is angry, they can't give the mercy that the other person needs. And so they need to be able to sit with somebody who can, like Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, really compassionately look at and love, or the woman who, uh, at, of Samaria, uh, you know, who had the five husbands and the lover, just the way that Jesus gazes and loves and names names the truth, but with such mercy and such compassion, so that the person can forgive themselves, the person can receive love, mm -hmm. the person can let go of the shame, praying into those areas of shame, going into the memories, like I just talked about, and allowing Jesus to speak to that part that felt the shame in those moments. And, and to have that shame relieved and released and forgiven. Um, and so the healing has to take place on both parts, and then together that healing can take place. Okay. And then should they go to see someone together after they see someone separately, or what do you uh, think? 
maybe depending on how free they are at that point you know there may be that need next step see you know or they could go together and that person works with each of them individually and then brings them back together uh, it depends on the therapist or the prayer minister or whoever it is that's helping them it doesn't have to be a therapist kind of going along with that um dr shoots do you think that people who are struggling with pornography or addictions should they still be in a relationship or should the person stay with that person um, when they're going through that? If yeah, it's that, currently happening, because this was a past experience, but what's, what if it's present? It, it depends on whether it depends on whether that person is in the process of facing it and healing or not. Hmm. So if a person's not repentant and continuing in say pornography use, uh, then no, they shouldn't. They should separate until that's dealt with. However, if if it's something that started early in childhood and it's a compulsion, like I'm giving the example of John, mm-hmm. and the relationship is chaste, the relationship can help heal it. Mm. And the person who's on the receiving, you know, because both men and women now engage in pornography in different ways. Let's say it's the woman who's. Uh, with the man who's in sexual compulsion, because that's usually more often than the other, but it could be both ways. Mm-hmm. So the the love and the accept, you know, usually that compulsion is rooted in rejection and abandonment. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so if a person is able and willing to stay in the relationship in a chaste way and love with mercy and compassion and deal with the pain of it and share the pain of it, that could be a big part of the healing for the person, for both people in it. And so it's a discernment of, is there repentance and an attempt to heal? Mm -hmm. If so, they could stay together until it's healed. I wouldn't recommend getting married until there's that healing, although I've seen that. Uh, But if there's no repentance and it's just a, I have a right to this, then, then separation is necessary. Okay. Okay, here's another one. I'm on a deep healing journey. And although I desire to be a mother, she's married, I feel that God is desiring healing first. I experience panic and anxiety attacks daily. Is this a good enough reason to refrain from conceiving? It kind of goes along with another one too, actually. How do I battle this kind of despair or these panic? Yeah, what's going on? Yeah. So I can't. I can't say, I think that's a question for spiritual direction and a pastor. I can't say whether it's a sufficient reason or not to avoid pregnancy. Uh, I can say that your desire for healing is very necessary. And it was my panic attacks that thrust me into my healing process. And Mm -hmm. usually what's underneath the panic are a lot of wounds of abandonment, rejection, fear, mistrust. And so to really deal with those and, you know, if without playing God of saying, I'm not going to get pregnant until all this is dealt with, it's, it's probably prudent to uh, focus on this so that you don't bring that into, you know, those stages of life where you don't have the opportunity and time to focus on those things. Uh, So But generally, that would be my answer. And then same thing with despair. Despair is the heart shutting down in hopelessness. Mm. Uh, and it's usually from wounds that haven't been dealt with. And when that goes long enough, it can turn into depression or suicidal thoughts. Mm. Uh, but almost always, every level of that is from areas of the heart that maybe even not be conscious, where there's been wounding and, and there's no attention for those areas of woundedness. And so the way through despair is to begin to speak about the places underneath the despair. What is the despair about? Mm. And even if it's in the present moment, I I despair that I'll never meet somebody who will love me. Okay. Behind that is places where the heart hasn't been met in love somewhere in the past. And so the despair isn't all, isn't about the present and the future. It's about what's happened that keeps my heart from being able to receive this in the present in the future. Got it. It's like a trigger. It's a, a sign. It's a yeah. sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, are there any resources that you can recommend for someone to find professional help for these kind of healing? Yeah, up on our website, John Paul II Healing Center, we have a, a, a list of resources of both books, workbook, conferences, and therapists, uh, therapist organizations. Okay, awesome. Now, what if this is an interesting question? What do you think about feminine and masculine energy? Is energy something that goes according to the church teachings? Yeah, it depends. You know, there's there's people that use that in a very new age way. Mm -hmm. That you know is not according with church teaching. But energy is energy. I mean, all of us have mm -hmm. you know energy is. Emotion is energy in motion. You know, we all have emotion. We all have energy that moves our bodies. Energy is the ability to do work. Is there a different kind of energy from a male and a female? Well, I think when you get in the presence of men and women, you feel something different, whether you want to call it energy or not. Mm. There's, a, there's a different experience uh, that's communicated from men and from women. And, you know, we know those sometimes in even in pheromones and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot going on beyond the surface of what we can see. Uh, you know, and energy is just the activity of the protons and the neutrons, and all those things. And uh, there's, there's energy exchange and attraction. You know, there's mm -hmm. an attraction of energy. Uh, you know, we, so yeah, and in its proper context, you can think of that in a Catholic sense, but we can also get into some weird new age spiritualities that way. Yeah. I think sometimes people talk about spirits and energy and it's like, no, those are, you know, they're sometimes it's a spirit. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Dr. Bob, I've experienced healing of memories through prayer. And like the story you shared, sometimes there are memories that are too painful to go back into. What are some steps into not ignoring that part of the healing process? Yeah. Good. Good question. Um, one is, Jesus never forces us to go somewhere where we're not ready to go. Mm. We can only go to the places where our hearts are ready. And your heart naturally will stop if, you, if it's too painful. And that's what the person's describing. And so John didn't do anything wrong. He just wasn't ready mm. until then. He received what he could when he could receive it. Um, I think what's important is to continue the healing journey at the places where you are able. And that allows trust to happen, right? It's, it's, it's developing trust with these places of our hearts with Jesus. And the more security we have, the more we can trust him with the deeper places. Okay. But also with other people is to be able to continue to trust with other people because that trust, that security is what allows our hearts to open to those areas. And sometimes it's just the fear of going to those places that needs to be dealt with. And so we bring the fear to Jesus in prayer. And as he speaks to the fear, sometimes then we realize, oh, I can go to this place. I just created such a big monster in my mind that this is overwhelming and I can't do it. Whereas if he's with us, we can go to places we didn't think we could go before. Mm. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend is guy by the name of Carl, Dr. Carl Lehman talks about a manual approach to healing and it's ways of building trust with Jesus. Uh, and so that would be another avenue. Remembering the times that you were close to him. Yeah. And letting them, him in. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is a good question for parenting. What as parents can we do to minimize our wounds to our children? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I used to have when I was a therapist, I used to have parents come and bring their children and say, you know, I want my child to be helped, which is a great intention. Mm -hmm. And I would inevitably say, you're their best therapist. Mm -hmm. And you become their best therapist when you heal your own wounds. But it all flows downhill. So I think the best thing any parent can do for their children is, first of all, become aware of ways in which they're currently hurting their children and recognizing that it's a projection of something that's gone on in their own heart. It's a way that they relate to their own self based on their own woundedness and deal with that. And if they will 
in the real time of life begin to notice areas where they're hurting or their spouse is hurting the children. And there can be a merciful, compassionate focus on saying, you're not bad. Mm -hmm. There's a hurt place there that needs to be addressed. We don't want to keep hurting our children with this. Let's, let's deal with it. Let's go back and how am I relating to myself here? Mm -hmm. Okay. And oftentimes a parent will pick out a particular child who reminds them in some way of this part of themselves that they don't like oh, wow. and project onto them. Uh, usually the, the, the dad with a boy and the mom with a girl, but it could be different people at different times. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's that whole thing. If you don't transform it, you'll transmit it, right? Sister yeah. Mary, mm -hmm. <laughs> suffering so, is not transformed, is transmitted. Yeah. I think that was from Wounded Healers, something like this, right? Um, what are your thoughts, oh, on completing Unbound ministry sessions in regards to your healing journey? Yeah, Unbound is very good. Uh, there'll be a podcast coming out where I'm interviewed by Neil and Matt Lozano about the healing process. We also have one where we interviewed them. Mm -hmm. And so it gives people an opportunity to hear the similarities and differences. Uh, I would say that Unbound is really important for dealing with uh, this, the spiritual realities that keep us bound up mm -hmm. and the lies that are connected to that in terms of renouncing, uh, which is all part of the healing process. But as we've talked about with the Lozanos, there are places sometimes where the renouncing only creates a space for us to go to the deeper healing mm. that needs to be addressed. And it's not just a matter of removing the negative, but you know, they talk about blessing. It's a matter of God's presence, blessing those places that didn't receive the love that we needed. Mm -hmm. And so it's a both and. And so unbound is an approach to deliverance and healing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the inner healing that we do is an approach deliverance and healing and they're complementary they're not competitive yeah no i love the the interplay of it all and the depth and then yeah it's beautiful um oh this one one young woman there are so many levels of these stories of healing it can be overwhelming um and to try to figure out where to start in your own healing or even to know um how we may have been wounded where do we start how do we start yeah that's where I, I wrote, particularly around sexual wounds, that's why I wrote Be Restored, is that people were asking for a guide of being led through identifying and walking through the healing process. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's for that purpose. And I would just say in general, you, you start with what's going on in your life. You start with prayer and you ask God to show you what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are the manifest things on the top of the tree to go to the language of, you know, the, the be healed model. What are the, what are the things that I'm currently struggling with? And what am I ready to deal with? Mm. What am I bringing to confession? What am I constantly struggling with in my relationships? And Holy Spirit, would you begin to show me where th this is rooted? And again, it's a process. And so just being patient and gradual. Uh, and if you need people in the community or therapist or spiritual director to help you. Oftentimes with the deeper stuff, we need help to be able to see it and get to it. So letting the Lord lead us, that's start there. Um, how does a person seek grieving within relationships if it's hard for them to trust other people? That is difficult. Um, I would say there are some people that you trust more than others. Mm in your environment uh, and your your intuitive sense knows if somebody's trustworthy uh, to be compassionate towards you. Mm -hmm. And so I say, seek out those people, whether it's a, again, somebody in your community, somebody in the church, uh, a therapist, a spiritual director, uh, somebody who does Unbound, any of those are places mm -hmm. to, to begin to start or, or a grief group, you know, yeah. a, you know, just a grief group, that's what they're there for, is creating an environment. Uh, one of the most thing, things that was most helpful for when we were grieving my wife and my 
children's mother and grandchildren's grandmother is on different occasions the day she died and her birthday, we would get around and we would share memories. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel safe with a group of people to do that, then, then that won't work. But there are people that you can find groups of to just share about the loss, share about what's going on. And trust builds over time. It, you don't have it all at once. You, you, you risk vulnerability and then you grow in trust. Yeah. I know even with Bishop David, that was one of the most healing things is us getting together and just sharing stories. So yeah, coming into a group. Do you have any advice for someone who has significant fear of staying single yet at the same time fear of getting married? So they're stuck in this yeah. two fears. Mm -hmm. yep. I would say both of those fears are connected to deeper pain. We're, 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 if you're afraid of marriage, there's been experience with marriage that feels threatening. And if you're afraid of being single, there's experiences of feeling alone and abandoned that are mm -hmm. threatening. Okay, and so both of those need to be dealt with. And it could be from the same source, could be from different sources. Yeah, and but somebody a, asked that. Yeah. A trust oh. wound. It's a trust wound. Oh, a trust wound. Yeah, a fear wound, which is trust. You know, trust is the opposite side of the fear. And that's what one of, one of the masks is an adult child. How do you heal from those parental wounds or family of origin when this one, this person was saying she's, continuing emotionally of being abused by them and they're not willing to change. So mm. how does she um, heal from that? Yeah. Uh, again, there's going to be need, there's help going to be needed to help heal from that. But if we're involved in abusive relationships, there's a ways in which our boundaries have been trampled down. And it probably goes back pretty early in life. So one mm -hmm. of the things I would recommend is, the study of boundaries online. There's videos about boundaries. There's books on boundaries. Uh, but it's there needs to be healing because we don't have the strength to have those boundaries because of them being broken down. Uh, and so any place where we've been abused physically, verbally, sexually, emotionally, are places where our boundaries have been trampled. You know, think about mm -hmm. a neighbor coming and just running over your fence and coming into your yard. Well, that's what happens to us psychologically, emotionally, is somebody just comes and crosses over the line of respect to violation. And wherever those violations have been, it's really difficult then in present relationships to have healthy boundaries there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's usually a fear of abandonment if I have healthy boundaries. Right. And, and so there's deep ab abandonment pain along with the violations. And that's why children that don't have healthy attachment are much more likely to be abused because they're hungering for mm -hmm. love and willing to put up with what isn't love in order to be loved uh, because it's been missing. And so it's, it's a catch 22. Like you're willing to have crumbs just to experience that. Yeah. yeah when you were saying the offense, it made me think of trespass. Yep. Trespass. You know? Yeah. Forgive us our trespasses. Mm -hmm. yeah. how do you link the healing between your head and your heart she said it's easily easy to rationalize these truths in your head but how do you make those lasting changes in your heart yeah by safe loving relationships mm -hmm. uh, I had I was a therapist for many years I was teaching before I started my healing process uh, I had to get safe enough to be able to share my story in an environment where I could be heard because you know, to share it in other places, I, I could experience compassion, but I couldn't experience somebody facilitating me helping to get to those areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's the only thing that gets to the heart is when we walk into it. You know, it it remains theory until we walk into it. Yeah, and that, that's always a risk. Yeah, I think about love and responsibility too. Like, okay, it's not like a. You can't just watch it on the sidelines. You know, you have to actually love responsibly. Um, okay, two more. How can 
how come with Catholic psychology, they don't separate one sexuality from their upbringing in regards to men, especially why don't they see unhealthy patterns of growth due to unhealthy relationship with father or mother affect them in any relationship, whether that is with a man or a woman, because the trauma will still be there, even if a relationship with a gay man or his ability to connect with anybody seems like focusing on the aspect of his sexuality, you are missing the opportunity to heal. I'm not sure if that. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure what the question. Yeah. Uh, I hear the I hear the details. I think it's saying, why aren't we paying more attention to these areas to bring healing where there's sexual disorder? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I think, and that's a great question. It's my desire is we would do that more. I mean, we need to call sin sin, but we also, like Jesus, need to help heal the the person who's bound up in sin. Uh, you know, it's it's never enough just to name the sin. We, we always need to heal the person, mm. whether that's with ourselves or with other people. Yeah, you talk about that holistic approach, seeing the whole person, right? Yeah. Um, and this one, oh, I think I was taught to protect myself around men because if anything started even kissing, then it wouldn't stop and she would be at a high risk of going all the way. It was all my responsibility and I wasn't sure I had enough control for it. Instead, I pushed men away to protect myself from sin. Is there a way to heal this or is there a way to trust herself? And men? Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good example of a common struggle in, in Catholic worlds where we're trying to live chastely in that way. Mm -hmm. It's first and foremost the responsibility of the man to keep those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it shouldn't be only on the responsibility of the woman to keep those boundaries that becomes burdensome. So if a woman is protected in that way, she can then live in a place that matches her heart. Uh, the second is there's wisdom there, which is, you know, when we engage in passionate kissing, our bodies naturally want to respond with deeper sexual expression. And so there's a difference between being fearful and withdrawing and having good, clear boundaries. You know, it's being engaged, but having good, clear boundaries. And, and I think for all of us, I think if we're honest, it's the battle between our desires and our natural responses and our moral choices. And it's always something that has to be walked out. And I know in my own life, I've, I've done that too. You know, you pull back to be safe, but you pull yourself out of contact and then you get involved and then you begin to be afraid of, well, what if I have this desire? What if I have, you know, this situation and I feel out of control with it because my desires are so strong. And, you know, I th think the heart of that is recognizing one is that both men and women are supposed to keep that in a relationship. But secondly, that each of us is responsible for our choices and that no matter how strong our desires and passions are, they're not stronger than our will. Yeah. Uh, our will can always say yes and say no. Uh, and if they can't, then, then we do need to pull back and get, get support. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And this actually is connected to that. Is scrupulosity related to a wound? Yes. Uh, and it could be, again, I don't want to identify a singular wound, but there's usually this, these elements present. There's usually a pretty moralistic environment where the child's been taught and there's a fear of hell. There's a fear of punishment. There's a fear of anger. Uh, there's a fear of, of uh, rejection. Mm -hmm. there's, there's often shame that underlies scrupulosity. So if I do anything bad, I'm bad. Mm -hmm. And then I'm afraid that I'm going to be punished by the people around me or by God. And that's kind of the uh, the ingredients that are underneath it. It could be from any number of different things. Yeah. All right. Um, 
this has been awesome. There's a, a couple more, but I think we'll wrap it up. Is there anything else, um, Dr. Bob, about femininity or masculinity of healing those or any resources that we can go to um, that will help us in the actual practical of that? Uh, a couple of things that we offer, and then I'll share a couple other things. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have not offered for the last three years since COVID our Restoring the Glory course. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing it in Tallahassee in June as part of our seminary and priest program. So we'll have the seminarians and priests, but we're opening up to a small number of 50 people of the Catholic community to be a part of that. That would be, if, if you're interested in taking a big step in this, that would be a really good thing. And we don't have it up yet. It'll be up in the next week or so, but it'll be the first week of June in Tallahassee. Okay. Uh, a, a second step of that would be the book Re Be Restored, which is a step-by-step -step walking through that. So those are the primary research. We also have on our website, uh, Restoring the Glory, Restore the Glory podcast. Um, and I have a lot of stories of sexual healing mm -hmm. on their interviews of people, some of this process. So that would be another uh, avenue. Uh, if somebody's dealing with sexual compulsion, uh, Jay Stringer has a book, Unwanted. He's not Catholic, but he's a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good book. Uh, another book, uh, again, not Catholic, but Christian, is by Dan Allender. Um, another really good book. Uh, by Andrew Comiskey. Let's see if we can find it right here. Um, Rediscovering Our Lost Fullness. Mm. Um, Just pulling it out of your library, huh? <laughs> George, Holy Grit. My daughter has a book, Unbound, uh, or Undone, uh, which is about the feminine genius. Uh, my daughter and son-in-law have series of stories, St. Joseph, uh, and the, the journey of a man in the virtues of St. Joseph, and it's a lot of different people that people will recognize in that. Both books are stories of people in our masculine and feminine journey. So those are some of the resources. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bob. It's just been such a blessing. And we're hoping that our book studies will naturally flow and to be restored and be transformed. Um, and we hope that you can come to LA at some point. That would be so awesome. I know that was a dream. So yeah, I would love that. So thank yeah. you. Jen. And I'm, I'm excited about what you're all doing. It's, it's going to, it is, and it's going to bear so much fruit in all of your lives. The, the mm. journey that you're in. Thank you so much. Would you um, end in a prayer and just blessing us? I know you're a good father, so we can receive that. <laughs> Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we ask your blessing just to be poured out now on Jen and each person in this community. Lord, we just pray a blessing of our sexuality. Bless each woman in the dignity of their person. Bless them with trust and openness and protection and healing of the deepest wounds of their heart and hope and trust in the relationships in the present and the future and also the past. Lord, we pray each blessing on each man that each man could live in his identity as Zikar, as a man in the image of Joseph and Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that as men, we could live in the, in the strength that comes from our weakness, from our vulnerability of trusting in you, Jesus, trusting in you, Father, being blessed in our identity as beloved sons, and that women would be blessed in our, your identity as a beloved daughters. And we pray all this in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you, all yeah. of you from all over watching. Yeah, thank you all. Great to be with you. Yeah, and don't forget to love responsibly. Bye, everybody.